From the beginning of time, there has been an unfolding plan. It all began long ago with one person sent to a new and strange land. And as Abraham went, in every age others have followed. They were not all heroes, nor were they all powerful or rich. But in every age, they were there as witnesses that God can be trusted and that the grace and promise of God are the only gifts the church has to offer, gifts to be given with open hands. This is the story of Christ's seminary, a story of ministry with open hands. More than the story of just another school, it is the story of people who learned from a very special experience the value of community and the cost of placing the gospel at the center of their ministry. Above all, it is a story of the joy and the challenge of a lifetime lived out in service for God and for people. It is a story of ministry with open hands. apostles after the ascension, we have come together here today in our upper room. The situation is different. We're not awaiting the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has already come to us. And so the words of our Lord in the lesson, you will be witnesses for me, are not just prediction. They are command and promise. And he has given us a program that is to be carried out in sanctuary and in classroom, in inner city and outer suburbia, at old people's homes and at sick beds, in strivings for justice in the neighborhood and in the quest for peace out in the world. That mission takes many forms. Parish pastor, institutional chaplain, community organizer, classroom teacher, worker priest. But the work in it all is the same. You will be witnesses for me, the Lord says. In the Jerusalem upper room, when the disciples decided to fill the vacancy in their ranks created by the death of Judas Iscariot, there was one overriding criterion that they were looking for, a witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The disciples knew what their work was. They were to tell what they had seen and heard. They were to be witnesses for Jesus. And so are we. We are to make the connection between what God did in Jesus and what he does in us and to tell the world the difference that it makes in our lives. But we said that this is, for the sake of discussion, this is the arena of church. This is the arena of, if you want to put it that way, world. And the idea is he's the interpreter on both sides of what the theological reality in this bucket of existence actually is. The fact is, that you're stuck. If you want to be faithful, then you have to tell the truth. And the truth is both promise and judgment. You see what I mean? That's where we left off with Jack at the end. We said, sorry about that, Paul, sir. What happens is, if you want to be honest, if you want to function with integrity, then the truth is you're going to have to get ready to suffer. To declare a moratorium on all classes until such time as the Seminary Board of Control officially and publicly declares which members of the faculty, if any, are to be considered as false teachers and what scriptural and confessional principles, if any, have been violated. My own entrance into parish ministry was a rather stormy one. 
As I look back on it now, I can see all of the reasons for it, but in 1974, when I graduated from Concordia Seminary in exile, I was living the reality of it. But there I was, leaving Concordia Seminary, in total disgust with the things that I had seen taking place there, and in support of that faculty and staff which I had come to love and to respect so much. In 1973, the Synodical Convention brought some very serious charges against Dr. Chijin and the faculty majority. And in 1974, the Concordia Seminary Board of Control only seemed to make matters worse. The suspension of Dr. Chijin seemed imminent. I remember that as students, we were very frustrated. What could we do? In one way, we were in the best position to do something. We knew the faculty and we knew Dr. Chijin firsthand. We were in a good position to translate what was happening to the church at large. And as we look back to that <coughs> mighty fortress, we know these words are true. Well, in January of 1974, it happened. Dr. Tejan was suspended. The students went on their moratorium, a moratorium which eventually led to the formation of seminary in exile. It was a frightening experience but I also remember it as a beautiful experience. Beautiful because we, we all believed that we were really doing what was right. There was a sense of conviction that we were doing what needed to be done. I think there was also another feeling among us. Many of us felt that if we let that chance go by, if we didn't say what we felt we needed to say, if we didn't speak our conscience, that we would be setting a pattern for the rest of our lives. Well, I know when I came here, uh, our class, Jules and I came in the first class that started in the exile or after the exile had happened mm -hmm. and i had applied down at capital seminary and we had a place to live and nancy was looking into work and i was i was ready to go there and then uh i started finding out they some of the folks from seminaries came up to uh to valpo and we talked and i started rethinking the whole thing and i said well what is what am i really what are my goals in this whole thing if it's just for the sake of getting a call that i'd go somewhere else and that's that's not enough reason and I think that kind of mentality in, in th that I came here with is the same sort of thing that's sustained me at least through, through four years, realizing that that's, that's not the end all, and that uh, that faith, it sounds really foolish sometimes, but faith that, uh, that if the Lord wants to use me, that, that there will be a place to go to do that. One thing that I'm still interested in is just traditional, you know, parish ministry. And, and I find, sometimes I find myself defending that almost because there is a lot of, you know, by necessity, there is a push around here to get into different things, and that's exciting and it's neat. But for myself, I just feel called to a, a situation. I think, I think given my own capabilities and gifts, I could operate well in that situation. And that still is open for me. To me, the, the whole thing of diversity is such a crucial factor here. The fact that people have the freedom, profs, students, anybody, as I see it, to, to do their own thing. You know, they, they're aware of the rest of the people in the community, but, you know, if they've got an idea, they've got something they, they really want to explore. At least in my experience, people have had the opportunity and the freedom here to do that. And, I don't know, I guess, like, in my vicarage in Pennsylvania, I had contact with, with a, a number of the Lutheran seminaries in the eastern part of the country and, and some other seminaries around the country I've had experience with really good schools. But in terms of uh, Lutheran schools I'm aware of, seminary seems to be unique in the freedom that is allowed in the people that are here, more so than any that I've had contact with. And One of the neatest things for me has been to have uh, the Catholic lady, uh, Harriet Baggett, uh, Catholic lady in our Lutheran confessions class, you know, because I think, especially, you know, look back, I went to Concordia, Milwaukee, you know, and that was back in the high school, you know, still system, and it's become so easy just to, you know, to lambast the Catholics in the old 16th century Reformation, you know, they, they thought this, and this is why we're right. 
And, you know, to have the Catholic lady right in there in the confessions class, you know, raising her hand saying, well, that's not the way we teach it anymore, though, <laughs> you know, and to, and to really share, you know, a real Christian faith with somebody as different. Even before Jesus' own historic ministry begins, by the way in which uh, the shepherds, as they're called, start to carry the torch. They probably don't even know what they're talking about. Uh, Luke doesn't tell us how much of what they uh, actually beheld at the manger scene they understood. Doesn't even tell us whether they uh, believed, really. They saw, and they told what they saw and heard, whether they themselves even began to comprehend uh, such words by the angel as, uh, to you is born this day for all the people a savior who is Christ the Lord. But, uh, I would like to be the, an, a, uh, an associate in a parish. I don't want the responsibility of a parish all on my own, and that's very honest. Um, I am excited about the opportunities for team ministry. I think that um, the realm of things that a man and a woman can do together in ministry in caring for, the, for all of the people in their church, men and women, families, can be done in a way that it's never been done before, in a way that people have really been, been missing and been lacking. And I think because we haven't experienced it, people don't realize the loss. And as it's coming into existence, it's becoming a really exciting thing for the people in the church. The concrete thing that I can come up with is that ministry is you know, trying to meet people's needs. And uh, I guess, you know, anything that is meeting people's needs is a form of ministry. I guess for me it's more the aspect of needs that involves, you know, a faith relationship with their Creator and Lord, um, a point where they can have a need met that will also give them a handle on who they are as a person. And, who they are in respect to their family, who they are in respect to the society they live in. Um, if I read correctly what you, what you just said, I, I guess I'd sort of tend to affirm the, uh, the style of thinking about ministry that uh, puts the need first, uh, rather than some kind of uh, super and maybe imperialistic form of uh, pressure that puts you, you know, in contact with people and initiating that contact. With me, uh, there's a lot of things that we get here in terms of, uh, you know, being a part of this community. But really, uh, the agenda for my internship year coming up here now is, is just that. Uh, how am I going to fit in to the situation that I'm placed into <clears throat> in terms of uh, where do my talents and abilities uh, come into mesh with what those people want, what those people need? Cleveland has been well blessed for two and a half years now with the presence of 10 Seminex graduates. This goes back uh, about three years ago when a seminary professor told us that there were these fellows available, we're looking for ministry, we're willing to take some risks. We promised them only a sense of community here, a small car allowance, the fellows came and have been in ministry over these years. For the last year and a half, I've been working here in Cleveland as a nursing home ombudsman. A nursing home ombudsman is a person who investigates, identifies, and resolves complaints that nursing home residents have about the care they're given or the food or any complaint that they have. We also on occasion work with nursing home staff and administration to resolve complaints they have. The nursing home that we're at today, Madonna Hall, is one such nursing home that we've been working with for about six months now. This nursing home does not meet uh, federal and state building codes. 
Therefore, the state of Ohio at one time did try to close them. But because we felt that because of the overall dedication of staff here and because they really do provide good nursing care, that they should be allowed to remain open, we actually went to federal court with them and helped them to get an injunction to buy some time to renovate their facility. And that's what I'm out checking on today. They're about a week into construction, and we hope that very quickly now the facility will be upgraded. I'm really excited about this form of ministry because if I read the Gospels correctly, Jesus in his ministry encountered a lot of brokenness, and he dealt with that brokenness. And as I look around my world, I see a lot of brokenness, particularly in the lives of nursing home residents who feel that their dignity and self-worth has been stripped from them. I really feel that what I do is important as augmenting what the parish is able to do. A parish itself is simply not able to run a program of this magnitude because we do cover a five-county area. Seminex was important to me in that it gave me a chance to check out various forms of specialized ministries. For example, I worked for the parole department for the state of Missouri for a year while going to Seminex. And these kind of opportunities were important to me because they helped me see the need for specialized ministries and they help prepare me for the kinds of things that I encounter every day now. I graduated from Seminex in the spring of last year and was called to Zion Lutheran Church here in Wausau, Wisconsin that same spring. I'm involved here in a core ministry, a team ministry, along with Pastor Dale Erickson and Pastor Clarence Harms. When our congregation was looking for a minister of youth, our call committee interviewed eight candidates for the office, and they were convinced that David Osborne was the very best person we could call. He had more experience in youth ministry. He had more commitment to a team ministry approach. And we're convinced he had more of a gospel-centered orientation that we have come to expect from graduates under the faculty at Seminex. Much more specifically, my official title is pastor and minister to youth. We have basically the same setup as any core ministry together. We are assigned various times when we preach, uh, shut-in callings that we have, and visitations to the members of our congregation. It's been my privilege to have been working on the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation northern Wisconsin for the past four years. Stockbridge once the Indian people, a band of Mohicans originally from the East Coast. I've learned a lot in these four years from the Indian people here. It has been a very rewarding experience to have been included in the total life of a different culture. Yeah, it's been my experience as a vicar to have to deal with my personal racism and learn from the acceptance of the people here about my life, about my upbringing as a white person, and also especially, I think, about how I relate to people in my Christian faith. And uh, there's been a lot to learn from the people here about just how to do that for myself.
Well, one thing that uh, impressed me deeply, um, it was a strand that ran through, I think, all of her presentations uh, and speaking while she was here, was that um, people in general <coughs> try to avoid suffering in that we don't um, admit that it's among us and because we're human a lot of hurtful and bad things happen mm -hmm. in our lives mm -hmm. and um, the realistic thing to do is to say yes that exists but how can it be meaningful how can I live a meaningful life of faith in the midst of all these problems right. that are around us and it's true there have been whole uh, movements in uh, religion whole units of Roman Catholic uh, religious particularly, whole units of uh, uh, <coughs> Protestant mystics that have assumed that the ideal of life is no trouble, which is a very unbiblical thought. There is nothing in the world like that, or that have assumed that trouble is not from God. Whereas Hebrews says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he accepts. Uh, and the Lord Jesus did not say, don't have trouble. But he said, let not your heart be troubled. As our Lord Jesus was presented to God in the temple, so these students who will complete their preparation for ministry at Christ Seminary Seminex, at the close of this term, are here in this holy house to present themselves to God for service to church and world. In the name of Christ, our Lord. In seminary, in classroom, in inner city and outer suburbia, at old people's homes and at sick beds, in stands for justice in the neighborhood and in the quest for peace out in the world. Sent in mission in many forms, parish pastor, institutional chaplain, community organizer, classroom teacher, worker, priest. But the work in it is all the same. You will be witnesses for me, the Lord said, witnesses for Jesus, witnesses of what God did in Jesus and what he does in us to tell the world the difference it makes in our lives.